Welcome to The Access. I'm your host, Havi Buzo. In this episode, we'll be discussing U.S. strategy in Syria, the upcoming Israeli elections, and the future of the Iranian presence inside of Syria. To talk about all of this, we are joined by Andrew Gable, research analyst at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, and Dr. Jim Robbins, senior fellow for national security affairs at the American Foreign Policy Council. Thank you so much both for joining us today. I want to start by asking, you know, after the Mueller's report came out, um, now a lot of people were saying that this administration has been held hostage by the investigations on the Russian collision. Um, do you expect us to see a, a stronger posture by the administration specifically on foreign policy issues than before? Or are we seeing going to see a continuation of the same strategies, basically? Whoever wants to go first. I think one might be able to argue that the investigation in some ways hamstrung the president domestically. It's not clear to me that it has constricted his ability to conduct a foreign policy abroad. And so even though there are benefits that will redound to the administration politically, given its conclusion, uh, I don't see any direct correlation or change in the administration's national security posture on the basis of the investigation itself. Mm -hmm. What would you say to, about that, Jim? Uh, I would agree with that, and particularly with respect to Russia, uh, I don't think we'll see any shift in policy uh, one way or the other. The president has taken somewhat of a hard line uh, on various issues that are of concern to Russia, whether it's uh, with the Iran nuclear deal or, more recently, the troops in Venezuela. Uh, so I don't think that the president will be shifted from that position uh, one way or the other. Some people were not seeing the maximum pressure campaign the administration talked about in terms of the Iranian regime. Uh, there are many things that could be done that were not done to the fullest, according to many experts in Washington. Do you expect us to see any extra pressure now on Iran or any shift in the strategy uh, towards the Iranian regime now that the administration is probably more available to focus on these issues? Well, yes. I, I think that even though the maximum pressure campaign uh, has been announced, and, and to, I, I don't want to de-emphasize how, um, how striking the contrast is between what the Trump administration has pursued with the snapback sanctions related to JCPO relative to where the Obama administration ended. And so I just, it is having a tremendous effect on the Iranian economy. Inflation, mm -hmm. from all indications, is out of control. Uh, the but internal budgets that the Iranian government are able to pass are smaller than they've been. They're having tremendous difficulty gaining access to hard currency, um, and it is constricting their ability to project power, I would argue. Mm -hmm. That being said, when the administration announced um, the precipitous withdrawal from Syria in December, I think the Iranians saw that as an opportunity, and in contrast to the maximum pressure campaign, the area in eastern Syria is geographically very valuable. It is a wedge in between Tehran and Damascus. If the U.S. controlled this area, or at least the U.S. friendly U.S. ground partners, such as the Syrian Democratic Forces, were able to retain a semblance of stability here, it would constrict the ability of Tehran to funnel weapons and material from the east into the west, where it could go you know, in western Syria. It could threaten Israel through Lebanon. And so, Yes, there. Are, you know, when the administration indicates that it might be willing to give up this territory, I think it does contradict its own stated policy of maximum pressure. This has since been walked back somewhat. If the United States retains this position, I think it will be consistent and support its stated maximum pressure policy. Mm -hmm. What would you say about that, Jim? Well, part of the problem is with the transfer of power in Congress to Democrats, uh, the president has a much less willing partner in terms of taking legislative action to implement this policy. So he has to work around the fact that Democrats are not going to be as interested in clamping down on Iran as a Republican Congress would have been. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, we've seen more of a willingness of the administration to use energy as a uh, element of national power, to exploit the fact that the United States is a growing energy now exporting power. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that the United States can be involved in these energy markets, that naturally will make it more difficult for the Iranians you know, if we have lower oil prices or Americans trying to impede on their markets uh, since the Iranian economy 
is oil-based, energy-based. It doesn't really have a lot of else it can do. And so to the extent the administration can use that to uh, hurt the regime or to hurt their economy, they probably will. Um, I mean, obviously, we're not going to be comparing the Trump administration foreign policy to the Obama, uh, even on Russia, because uh, this administration has put much, many more sanctions, basically, it, on it, it Russia. Has. It's been much harder on Russia than the Obama administration the in a lot Obama. of ways, despite a lot of the domestic political rhetoric you hear yes. in the chattering classes. Yes, but, you know, when we're talking about now the United States deciding and President Trump basically declaring he's going to be keeping hundreds of troops in Syria, uh, 200 in the uh, eastern part of Syria where the SDF forces are and then 200 in the 10th uh, base. Is that, how much is that going to change on the ground for these forces and obviously for the Iranian influence? Well, I think those forces are actually tremendously valuable, not necessarily because of only their military capacity, though they do have a tremendous military capacity, their elite troops or special operations forces, um, but the political significance. They represent a kind of political tripwire that prevents Iran, Assad, and Russia from retaking al Tamp, which sits on a key highway that would uh, once again connect to Iran and Damascus, and so it's very valuable. The presence of U.S. forces deters and prevents that territory from being retaken. Um, and with respect to the East, I think that it's notable that Special Envoy to Syria, Jim Jeffrey, reiterated the fact that the U.S. will defend this portion with air power. And so if the U.S. Mm -hmm. Air Force is a factor in this equation, that will stop um, that will stop a reconquest of the East if the U.S. has the political will to make it so. I mean, there's been one significant challenge to the Euphrates River deconfliction zone at the beginning of 2018. A Russian-backed mercenary group with, with some other proxies looked like it was about to attack East and Deir Azor. Uh, the U.S. called in airstrikes. This force was obliterated, and since then it's not been challenged. So I actually think that if the U.S is willing to defend this area with air power, then a relatively small number of elite troops might be enough, actually, to hold mm -hmm. this territory, because it's a political question, not just a military one. Um, go ahead. Oh, well, yes, I would agree with that. Uh, the fact that the United States is willing to leave this uh, tripwire force, uh, it's a uh, statement to the measure of stability that the United States would like to see in that area, mm -hmm. and a statement from the United States that they would defend uh, those Kurdish areas if anyone chose to attack them. As you say, the uh, airstrike against those Russian mercenaries was extremely effective. It was essentially a test to see how serious the United States was, to see how serious uh, Donald Trump was. And then they got their answer, which was mm -hmm. total obliteration. Um, but Andrew, you know, people still get concerned when they know that the president can change his, his mind at any minute on this issue because he already have. Would you, do you have the same concerns on maybe at one point saying, you know what, we're going to be pulling those couple of hundred uh, troops out of Syria? I do have those concerns, and if I were a member of the Syrian Democratic Forces, I would certainly have those concerns. And I think it's critical for the administration to be consistent with its engagement in Syria, not just rhetorically, um, but tangibly and over the long term. I mean, the <coughs> Syrian Democratic Forces have been a tremendous asset, not just to obliterating ISIS, but also as acting as a kind of blocking force to the alternative. I mean, if the Syrian Democratic Forces are demobilized, if the U.S. Uh, pulls out of Syria arbitrarily, someone is going to fill that void. In Iraq, it was when we pulled out in 2011 precipitously, it turned out to be ISIS and Iran. If we pull out again, it will likely be some combination of Iran, Assad, and Russia. That is not good for the U.S. interests. And oh, by the way, the conditions that would allow ISIS to reorganize and rise again would, would essentially exist if the U.S. leaves a power vacuum. It's an estimated 15 to 20,000 armed adherents of ISIS today, even mm -hmm. post-territorial uh, defeat. Now, now between Syria and, and Iraq, as estimated 15, by 15,000. 15 to 20,000. And this mm -hmm. is according to the CENTCOM commander, um, General Vodal, um, mm -hmm. and also Special Envoy Jeffrey. 15 to 20,000 armed adherents between Iraq and Syria. Mm -hmm. And so something is going to happen to them. And if the U.S. isn't keeping its eye on the ball, those uh, sleeper cells, those fighters may very well rise again and once again strike at U.S. assets and in some cases U.S. personnel. Yeah, this is a big concern, and also that the Assad regime, as well as threatening the SDF, basically, we're going to take these areas either by some sort of uh, reconciliation, as they call it, 
uh, which we, we saw what happened when other areas were reconciliated with the Assad regime. Basically, they go in and they, they start taking away and, and detaining all of the fighters or and the families and ho holding them hostages and so on and so forth. Um, also, um, you know, we know that the Iranian regime is going to be with the Assad regime, but it's either by force or by some sort of a treaty. Uh, do you think the SDF is going to hold on to its position of not uh, making amends with the Assad regime. That's the fear of many. Uh, Go ahead. Well, from an American perspective, I think it's important to note that the Trump administration's policies in Syria were much more restricted than the Obama administration's policies. The only reason why the United States was present in Syria, according to the Trump policy, was to combat ISIS, and that the Kurdish issue was not necessarily a part of that. That issue is evolving now as ISIS is defeated and the United States has to make choices regarding this future. So, and you know, leaving the stability force behind is part of that. That should encourage uh, Kurds to look at the uh, entrees from the uh, Assad regime to sort of come back into the fold more skeptically with the idea that they will have protection from the United States if they choose to retain some form of autonomy or at least argue for that or re remain separate so long as U.S. forces are present. Mm -hmm. So the important thing now is, will the Trump administration adopt a new rationale, not just, not just to prevent the resurgence of ISIS, which is on its own a good mm -hmm. rationale, but also something along the lines of preventing Iran from filling the gap, filling the void if the Kurdish forces go away, or to just say, you know, come right out and say, we're in favor of Kurdish autonomy, mm -hmm. which the Trump administration hasn't been as willing to make a strong stand on that, but may be in the future. Mm -hmm. What would you like to add to that, Andrew? I would just want to reemphasize, and I agree with what has been said, has been said and I, I think the U.S. is a critical variable. Um, even if there is ultimately some kind of reconciliation between Damascus and the Kurds in the east, the U.S. would have to at least be a player at the table. Um, otherwise, the Kurds have no leverage, right? I mean, if right now U.S. air power, U.S. political production, U.S. special forces are key in ensuring that Assad and Iran don't reconquest the country. If that's gone and Assad and Iran can, re can reconquer the country, mm -hmm. what, what, uh, A, what bargaining power do the Kurds have, and B, what incentive does Assad and Iran have not to just take as opposed to giving something up? And so I think it's really critical, even if the U.S. ultimately has designs to leave Syria responsibly, it has to stick it out until there and, and provide its uh, leverage to the Kurds in negotiations with Damascus until there can be a, a somewhat equitable and sustainable political solution. I mean, there are real doubts about Assad's capacity, let alone his willingness to properly conduct a counter-terrorist mission mm -hmm. uh, in the east. And so even if Assad has controls the territory on paper, his, his ability to bring the resources and the experience and frankly, the ability that the U.S. has in making sure ISIS doesn't reemerge is questionable, to say the least. Um, there's one player in Syria today that is very clear on its position and very consistent, which is Israel. Uh, we saw there's airstrikes against uh, the Iranian militias in Aleppo, which is the furthest point in the north of Syria meaning that even, you know, the Russian plan to, that was uh, Russia trying to basically market uh, to have Israel, uh, you know, hold off 100 kilometers within Syria where there will be no Iranian militias. Uh, it's very clear that Israel is standing its course of, no, we're going to be going as far as we need to to make sure that uh, Iranian militias are not present in Syria. Uh, and what about the S-300? I mean, there's a lot of questions. What would you make of this um, very uh, clear message by Israel yesterday against the Iranian militias in Syria? Well, I think Israel will do what it has to do to make sure that the Iranians can't marshal forces and, def and essentially um, th threaten the, the long-term territorial uh, legitimacy of, of Israel. Uh, and that means not putting forth a 100-kilometer zone while on kilometer 101, you know, hundreds of thousands of rockets and missiles are, are waiting. I mean, I think mm -hmm. Israel has always taken the initiative when it comes to war, and I think that's the case in Syria. And they've been, to the, to the extent they've involved themselves, they've been very effective in interdicting Iranian uh, shipments, rare, um, and, and they've been very um, 
effective in, in eliminating ground proxies to the extent they're able to target them. And so it's a question, I think, if the U.S. moves, the, the ability, of, I mean, a lot of this will hinge on some classified information that none of us have access to, but mm -hmm. I, I think that just to reemphasize the importance of the U.S. as a stability force in the East, if the U.S. is removed and suddenly all of Syrian sovereign territory is functionally under the control of Iran, the ability of, of Israel to reach all the way northeast is, is somewhat degraded relative to its ability to strike in Damascus. And so there are real strategic implications for Israel if the U.S. doesn't stay the course, at least for the time being. So Israel is strong in its position now as long as the United States is there. And I, I, mean, I think saying? Israel is strong, it is a very strong force no matter what. But I, yes, I think... I mean in terms of their interference I in think Syria. Israeli interests would not be served if the U.S. if the U.S. were to pre precipitously withdraw and leave a power vacuum that was ultimately filled by Iran in the East. Exactly. What would you say about that, Jim, uh, that Israeli airstrikes against the Iranian militias all the way in Aleppo? Well, it shows, number one, that Israel will go anywhere in Syria to strike a target that they think that they need to strike. Uh, we don't know exactly why they struck that target. We know a few people were killed. Perhaps it was an intelligence center. Perhaps there was a high There was Iraqi, commander. Iraqi militia fighters as well. Okay. So, Which is, yeah. So, yeah, there, 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 there will always be a reason why that specific target was chosen, and it was important enough for them to go that far uh, afield to go get it. Uh, the second thing it tells us is that the Syrian air defenses are incapable of defending their country since Israel could fly across the whole length of their country uh, south to north in order to strike this target. And it implies that the Russians were willing to allow Israel to make this kind of overflight, although we don't know exactly how they got there, but it does kind of imply that Russia was willing to withdraw its uh, air defense uh, to allow Israel to make this uh, strike unimpeded. So that mm -hmm. should also be a message. I mean, yeah. Uh, would you like to add something about this, the yeah, S-300? Yeah, I, I would actually like to comment on the S-300 uh, specifically. Yes. Um, I, right, right now, the and I think for the time being and for the foreseeable future, um, Israel is not uh, interested in killing Russians, right? Mm -hmm. And so the issue with the, three, the S-300 is such that if it's only Syrians, Assad, collaborators who are operating the S-300, I don't think is Israel will have a problem striking to make sure its airplanes are shot down. If it's only Russians, they won't have to because the Russians won't shoot at Israeli airplanes. Mm -hmm. the, the question mark is when there's commingling, right? So if Russia delivered these systems, it's training Syrian crews. Um, it appears that these S-300 batteries didn't shoot at the Israeli planes. One explanation is that the Israelis have some countermeasure that renders them safe. Another is that Russians uh, are still helping Syrians get these systems back online. And so I don't think we should necessarily assume, not that you weren't doing this, but I think uh, to the casual observer, I wouldn't necessarily assume that just because the S-300s didn't present a threat on this particular sortie mm -hmm. that they may, that they'll never present a threat again. I mean, if the Russians mm -hmm. back off, or let's say the training cycle is complete, Syrians have full control, they might very well start taking pot shots at Israeli airplanes. But we saw what happened before when the Assad regime forces tried to take uh, strikes, and they actually, um, was it a Russian airplane that got hit? Yes. And, and that was... Inadvertently. I, yes. To, 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 yeah. But yeah. yes, it, it's very dangerous to have all these countries operating in contested uh, war zones, and then you have uh, crews f firing potentially blindly into the sky with surface-to-air missiles. So yeah, definitely increases the chance of an international incident, such as we saw but with the downing. But isn't that like. embarrassing to Russia because they had a loud, you know, response. They said, we're going to be given the S-300. There was a big announcement. And then nothing. I mean, it's, it's basically showing that Russia is not as uh, reliable and as strong and powerful and tough as it's trying to betray, at least to the observer and, and today. I mean, what would you like uh, to say? It, it, because well, this a, is very important a, to Putin, right? Yes. Being well, tough. It, it is embarrassing to Russia if their <laughs> weapons aren't working and they make a big deal about it because, of course, they want to export those weapons to other countries mm -hmm. and, you know, have a favorable uh, payoff from that. But it's not worth shooting down an Israeli aircraft to the Russians just to be able to prove that their weapons work. That would be a is much bigger issue. Is there an agreement? Issue. Is there an agreement when Benjamin Netanyahu went to Russia and spoke to Putin, was there any agreement that happened? I think it's clear that there was some kind of deconfliction for a mission like this to take place. Uh, it would be, 
it, it may be possible for Israel to get there with some kind of flight plan where they didn't cross into the Russian zone, mm -hmm. but it, it would be much easier for them to just have a deal with the Russians to allow them to do this, which again gets back to why this mission was undertaken and why the Russians thought it would be in their interest to rather let Israel go ahead and do this while not publicly acknowledging that, but just kind of let it happen to take out a target that maybe Russia wasn't interested in defending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I would also just point out that while Iran and Russia have been to, to militarily united and essentially propping up the Assad regime, if the war is, is the hot por portion of the war is coming to a close, there's suddenly in some ways a, a kind of competition between the two, mm -hmm. between the two for the spoils of war, um, you know, for the natural resources, one thinks of the phosphate mines in, in Palmyra. Uh, and, and so mm -hmm. to the extent, and to say nothing of the fact that if they're both in the scene, then Assad can play one off the other, whereas if one has exclusive access to Assad, they have more power. And so I, I, it's not inconceivable to me that uh, Russia wouldn't take enormous risks to defend Iran uh, if someone else takes the risk of weakening Iran, because that ultimately could redound potentially to the benefit of Russia long term. Okay. Um, I do want to talk about the Israeli elections a, a little bit and how would that affect these uh, very strong positions. Uh, some people do worry that when, if, let's assume that Bibi does not win the elections and we have somebody like Gantz, even though he is a general, a former general, and uh, I mean, uh, you know, in his APAC speech, he was very clear that they would continue to confront Iran when they need to. But some worry that the left in Israel and the center, especially when they have to collaborate to form a government, they are more focused on internal affairs. Um, do you agree with this assessment, or, or are we going to be seeing a continuation of the strategy that we've been seeing by the government of Benjamin Netanyahu? I think the left in Israel has moved towards a much harder foreign policy line. They've pretty much had to as the strategic situation has changed around Israel. What used to be the main foreign policy issue of the peace process is no longer the main issue. Now Iran has become the main issue. And with Iran, there's really no compromise. There's no like, we're going to trade land for peace or any of the traditional uh, left-wing uh, talking points. Iran is just out to destroy Israel, and so it becomes a very clear issue. Uh, when you have that, when you have Iranian militias and you know, Hezbollah and other people f massing on your border, then you need to take action against that. So not only do I think that for political purposes, uh, people like General Gantz and others are, are taking this line, I think even in a government that the uh, non-Netanyahu would form, another candidate might form, even with very left-wing coalition partners, in terms of Iran and Syria, those issues, they would still take a very hard line. As, as hard as the right-wing Likud um, government? There might be some recalibration, but I concur that irrespective of who's leading Israel, the military, political, and strategic imperative remains to make sure Iran doesn't establish a massive foothold in Syria and stockpiles weapons and controls through proxy forces a great deal of the territory. Um, and so I think that there will continue to be Israeli action no matter what happens on election night. Um, and you know, to, 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 in great specificity, there might be some changes. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the Israelis are not going to sit on their hands and allow you know, Iran, which has on multiple occasions uh, announced its intent to wipe Israel off the map, mm -hmm. to load the gun, to raise it at Israel, um, and then potentially pull the trigger. So I think Israel will continue to be assertive in Syria no matter what. I mean, how assertive, though, could Israel be? And, and to when we talk about, OK, we don't want any Iranian forces in Syria, what would that look like? What that strategy would look like? Is it just the continuation of very, um, you know, uh, basically far in between uh, airstrikes against Iranian militia bases? Or we might see something more of a kind of stronger force uh, used by Israel to basically you know, wipe out that, that presence, that military presence, because they're there. It would be difficult for Israel to do s sort of like what it did in Lebanon in the mm -hmm. 80s, you know, kind of invade and occupy and then demilitia the area, because where do you go from there? Do you just continue to occupy it? Mm -hmm. You're not going to destroy these people. They could retreat into Iran and come back later. Mm -hmm. So in, in the long run, that kind of strategy probably wouldn't play out. 
the current strategy of taking selective strikes against key targets, whether they're supply or leadership or things like that, that could probably work uh, for a while. Uh, not again, not in the long run, because what if the Iranians just keep sending people? If they have mm -hmm. a friendly, stable government in Syria that will allow them to base their people there, then that's going to be a problem for Israel. And but it's unlikely that Israel could force a military solution on it uh, mm -hmm. that would work for the long term, maybe for the short term, but then it would just create even bigger problems. I agree, and, and the possibility of Israeli soldiers occupying large swaths of Syria, even small swaths of Syria, I, I think is a non-starter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, some were expecting that, you know, after the Israeli elections, now we have the Mueller report out, a stronger posture by the administration. Could that affect the American-Israeli strategy in the overall Middle East? I, I, once again, I'm not convinced that the Mueller investigation was driving American policy either in Syria or the broader Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, despite the fact that President Trump campaigned on pulling troops out of Syria mm -hmm. until December, he had actually had a very assertive and muscular policy towards Syria. Mm -hmm. Senior members of his of his um, of his administration, from the National Security Advisor John Bolton, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and all these people, and to say nothing of the Special Envoy Syria, had all reaffirmed U.S. troops are going to be in Syria until ISIS is destroyed, not just as a territorial entity, as an organization, until U.S., or excuse me, until Iranian ground proxies are removed, and until there's political reform from Damascus in accordance with U.N. Security Council Resolution 2254. This was the policy of the Trump administration yes. until the Zermatt. And, and this happened against the backdrop of the Mueller report. And so I just don't think that the administration, putting aside the merits of keeping a residual force or not keeping a residual force, I'm in favor of it, I just don't think it was driven really by domestic politics. And frankly, even when Trump made the announcement in late December, mm -hmm. there was no political pressure domestically really yes. to bring troops out of Syria. No one was mm -hmm. telling him to. This was something that he, as far as I can tell, um, initiated himself. And, mm -hmm. and so I don't think that the American Syria policy is really affected by the, by the DC uh, mm -hmm. Mueller situation. Yeah. And my question was about the Middle East in general, and that would include Israel after the elections that are going to you know, happen in a few days. Well, that would depend on the outcome of those elections. If uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is able to put together a new coalition and, and stay in government, then things will keep going pretty much as they have been. Mm -hmm. Then we will see the release of the peace plan, the deal of the century, what have you, mm -hmm. which we're all eagerly awaiting to see what the mm -hmm. details are, and then it will be much easier at least to kind of launch that if you have a government in Israel that you've worked with before, the president and the prime minister have a personal relationship going back for many years, that just makes things easier. If they have a new government, well then there will have to be changes, they'll mm -hmm. have to get to know the new government, see how they work together. Uh, maybe the peace plan will have to be rewritten to mm -hmm. some degree to uh, make it more palatable to the new government. Mm -hmm. We just don't know. Um, what would you expect we're going to be seeing uh, after the release of the piece of uh, the deal of the century? Um, we also have been noticing that the administration is clear, basically very clear on the fact that they do not want to be leading these efforts and that they want the Israelis and the Arab partners and the Palestinians to be the ones who are leading uh, these efforts, which is a major change in terms of the American uh, leadership historically to the Palestinian-Israeli uh, peace deals negotiations. Who wants to answer that? Uh, Andrew, well, it, Jim, it's hard to it's hard to say. To say that. Here's the deal of the century. We've made this plan. Now you you lead. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, but it, that's it, kind it, of what they hinted at. Yes. That was, Secretary Pompeo said um, a while ago. Yeah, well, it's just politically difficult to mm -hmm. say, you know, we're going to we're going to be the ones with the deal, but then you have to do something with it, and and then what will the U.S. role be to just kind of stand back and see what happens? And it'll, it'll be hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hopefully, if if that's the approach they're taking, it could mean that the United States wants to bring more parties into the negotiation than simply the Israelis and the Palestinians. Maybe the Saudis want to get involved in a more direct way, or maybe Egypt, or Jordan, or, or any neighboring countries, probably not Syria, mm -hmm. um, that they want to get them involved. And so maybe when we talk about the deal of the century, what we're talking about is a broader multilateral framework to resolve these issues, rather than what it has been so far, which has been Arab countries standing back and saying, when you 
Israelis and Palestinians have a deal, then we will get involved, yeah. which has not worked. So hopefully what we will see is a, a bigger plan with more people participating, and maybe that's what they're referring to. Yeah, that would certainly be a, a, a new kind of approach, though I, it's also, I think, important to point out that the more stakeholders you have involved, potentially the harder it can be to come to common ground. And so mm -hmm. um, I would just say the administration has been very effective in not telegraphing what it's going to do and preventing leaks. And so, so much of, I think, the ability to evaluate the deal is dependent upon the detail and the specifics that I just think it's hard before seeing the deal to evaluate whether or not it's working, whether it's the right tactic mm -hmm. and, you know, we don't know who's giving up what, and so I would, um, I would just uh, advise patience, and then once we actually have the deal, it might be easier to have a, a strong opinion about it. Yeah, what about uh, you know President Trump's announcement uh, first uh, that uh, Jerusalem is the capital of, Israel, uh, of the state of Israel, but then now the Golan Heights. Um, is there a, a, a mean to an end in these announcements? Uh, why is he doing this now, specifically with the Golan Heights? Uh, is it because they don't want to obviously be giving anything back to the Assad regime, or is it because they also maybe there's um, requests or asks by this administration to Israel eventually when the deal is released? Yeah, it could be part of a broader arrangement. We just don't know yet. I, I will say just from a military standpoint, the Golan Heights are, are very valuable defensive terrain. And given the degree to which Iran has not just been involved in the Syrian civil war, but has shown every intention of staying in Syria long term, has been stockpiling weapons, uh, this the idea that Israel could potentially give up this critical defensive uh, territory is, is, I think, if it were ever possible, it's certainly impossible now. And so I think that the fact that Iran has been ramping up in Syria um, is not entirely an irrelevant variable in the assertion of, of the territory, because just from a raw military standpoint, I don't think Israel would ever let it be used as a base of operations by Iranian proxy forces against the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, I would agree. I would, Israel will never give back Golan. It is just too important. It, it, not only uh, looking outward defensively, but if, if it became a firing platform for missiles, rockets raining down on northern Israel, I mean, they just cannot allow that. Mm -hmm. So in a way, what President Trump did was simply recognize reality, that this is one of the two areas that Israel formally annexed after 1967, the other being East Jerusalem. And with respect to Golan, it's simply saying, it's never going back. It's already been a nexus part of Israel, so why not recognize that? Mm -hmm. It could also be, as some have argued in the United States, a, uh, an attempt to influence the election, as sort of a gift to Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. So look, look at what he could achieve. He got the Americans to do this. And mm -hmm. it's certainly the Netanyahu campaign is playing it that way. Uh, it was also viewed in the domestic American context as a way to create tension on the Democratic Party side because Democrats want to say that they're pro-Israel, but maybe the, the progressives in their party don't want to go that far to recognize Golan. So it kind of increases the tensions on that side, uh, which works to the benefit of President Trump. Mm -hmm. Now, with, in terms of the American-Russian relationship, uh, when um, Pompeo said that we are going to get it, you know, be getting Iran out of Syria, he said that again. Is that in collaboration with Russia? I mean, is there any conversation, ongoing conversation between the administration and Russia, or are the relationship is, is in, probably in its worst uh, since the beginning of uh, the administration, um, you know, taking uh, the White House? Well, Russia and the United States have been in a lot of contact about Syria really for a long time since Russia intervened in September of 2015. There hasn't been any indication that Russia is on board with taking any risk and kicking out Iran. Um, late last year in September, uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, called U.S. calls for the removal of Iran proxy forces unrealistic and unreasonable. And so I actually think even though there, as I referenced earlier, there is some potential friction between Iran and Russia long term, mm -hmm. right now Russia is perfectly happy letting Iran be a, side, a thorn in the side of, of the U.S because um, Russia views the U.S. as a regional competitor. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that Russia views it as its interest to get Iran out just yet um, or, or ever. Um, mm -hmm. And there ha certainly haven't been any open indications that the U.S. and Russia could form some kind of anti-Iranian coalition in Syria. Mm -hmm. What would you like to say, Jim? Um, well, to the extent that, that Iran is present in Syria after the collapse of uh, the Islamic State, 
which was the rationale for them being there, uh, mm -hmm. or to prop up the Assad regime. As Syria becomes more stable, the rationale for Iran to be there fades. Mm -hmm. So one could reasonably ask, why are they there? And we know why they're there. It's to target Israel. That is mm -hmm. their reason. It is also to uh, threaten the Arab world. And to and, change Syria demographically, which is what's happening. Yes, uh, exactly. So they go from a stabilization force to a destabilizing force. And so Russia has to ask, to what benefit is it to have that happen? Mm -hmm. Why does Russia want that to happen? We, we know why Russia wants to have a stable Syria. They're long-term allies. It gives them a presence in the Middle East. They have ports on the Mediterranean. There are many reasons for that. But what, were the, what would the reasons be for Russia to want to have Iran change the whole state of play in Syria, to Syria becoming essentially an adjunct to Iranian hegemony mm -hmm. in that part of the world? It's one thing for, Iran, for Russia to support Tehran as Tehran. Mm -hmm. It's quite another to support the whole revolutionary program mm -hmm. of the Iranian regime to reshape the Middle East. And so if Russia wants to buy into that, fine, but they have to make that choice. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, it can benefit with the friction between Tehran and Washington, right? Yes, so they're exploiting that. Yes. Uh, but where does Hezbollah fall in all of this? Because Hezbollah is the one party that would, seems to be getting stronger in Lebanon, controlling more, the other parties are being marginalized. I mean, the United States continues to assert its support to the Lebanese army, but many argue that the Lebanese army is a part of Hezbollah and is heavily infiltrated by Hezbollah. Um, what does that tell us about the administration's position on Hezbollah specifically? Yeah, there are in indications that the Lebanese army has been somewhat compromised, as you mentioned, but I think it actually, I think Lebanon is actually an interesting uh, potential prelude to what a Syria under Iran or Tehran's thumb might look like. The, the idea you have these non, um, you have these pro Iranian proxy forces that are very well armed, very well funded by Iran, exerting not just a military influence, but political influence. And, and what you're seeing, um, on the ground in areas where there are heavy Iranian presence is is just this. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they, even though on a map it looks like Damascus has you know reconquered much of its territory west of the Euphrates all the way to Abu Kamal, uh, on the ground what a lot of these Iranian proxy forces are doing is more than just providing security. Um, they are providing f food, education, scholarships, in some cases... In uh, Syria. In Syria, in some cases, mm -hmm. um, ID cards so that the Iranian-backed proxy forces you know, don't hassle you as much. They're really making an effort, trying to convert people to, sh to Shiite Islam. They're making a real effort, as you mentioned, to change the demographics and the peacetime composition of these countries. And so um, if you want a, a, a look at the future of Syria, if Iran is able to exert tremendous amounts of power on the ground, mm -hmm. Lebanon would not in some ways be a bad way to start, which should get, send all kind of warning flags to, to people who are worried about regional stability and, and frankly, U.S. interests. But how? When you say about you know, sending those through Lebanon, how, what, what would the scenario look like? Sorry, how, I'm, I might have missed something. How would... What? No, you're talking about the, the scenario of the Hezbollah in Lebanon as how this is you know, shaping Syria as well. Is that right, what you're so, saying? Right. So if, you, if there was a politically powerful mm -hmm. Iranian-backed proxy force in Syria, it could have tremendous long-term consequences mm -hmm. for the composition of Syria. As well. Yeah. Well, w my question was that in, like in Lebanon, we have a, the largest minority is Shia, uh, naturally. In Syria, they're almost non-existing. Um, how would uh, Iran be able to apply that same scenario on the people in Syria, and would the time allow for that demographical change to happen, even though we're only talking about eight years? I mean, could Iran do this in only you know a decade to be able to, to make Syria into another Lebanon, which oh, is what I, a lot I mean, of people I wouldn't, are I wouldn't, afraid uh, of? I take the, the analogy too seriously yes. in the sense that, or too uh, literally in the sense that yes. Iran will be able to, you know, in 10 years, make the demographics of Syria look like Lebanon. That's not what I'm yeah. suggesting. The, the point I was trying to emphasize is that if Iran, if Tehran is able to gain tremendous power through proxy and political power, let's not forget mm -hmm. Assad, the, the Alawites are, are a significant minority. And so just because one is a demographic yes. minority in Syria doesn't mean that you won't, one won't be able to exert political influence. Yes. If Iran is able to 
um, exercise out, you know, uh, influence politically and militarily mm -hmm. um, outside of its demographic footprint, that could still spell uh, trouble for U.S. interests and still destabilize the country, mm -hmm. especially if it is able to essentially uh, develop roots in these areas beyond just the military proxy forces, but as we've seen, it tried to invade all portions of society. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you like to add anything to this, Jim? Uh, um, I think that's a good summary. I think uh, Lebanon is the next step uh, when we talk about Iran extending its influence uh, throughout the region. And uh, it's something to watch. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do want to talk a little bit more about the Kurds. Um, you know, we have Turkey. Turkey is a, a major player, uh, specifically in regards to Syria, because of the long borders that it shares. It's really interested in um, basically, you know, we saw what happened in Idlib. There is now a Turkish forces on the ground, even though we still have Jamaat Fath uh, the Al Qaeda affiliated group, still uh, operating in, in that area. That's a big question. Idlib is a very big question that's still not answered. Uh, by anybody. I mean, President Trump did protect Idlib so far, but, you know, we do have these different forces trying to play even together, Turkey and Russia and Idlib. But what about the Kurds? I mean, before we talk about Idlib, I want to talk about the Kurds. Um, what could the United States do, and, and how would the administration be able to make that balance between, you know, addressing the Turkish concerns let's say, and then protecting its major ally who defeated uh, the terrorist state of ISIS? It, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't. Go. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Take on the great question. Um, <laughs> we'll have you both talk about it. Yes. I'll be very quick. It's a great yeah. question. The, the key problem from the Turkish perspective is the fact that the Syrian Democratic Forces are dominated um, in form by mm -hmm. the YPG, which Turkey considers a offshoot of the, uh, direct offshoot of the terrorist, the U.S. designated terrorist organization, the PKK. Mm -hmm. And so President Erdogan is not going to um, essentially be able to feel safe while this force is directly on his border in places like Kobani and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Tel Abyad, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think any long-term arrangement, especially as part of a kind of safe zone, um, will involve at the very least moving YPG forces away from the border area itself. And how that can work, if that will be accepted, the, the mechanics of it are very complicated and are yet to be determined. So you're saying that Turkey is not going to sit there while the SDF continue to control that eastern part of Syria? I don't think, to, to, so there's no misunderstanding. I don't think Turkey is going to physically invade with a ground force the eastern part of Syria over U.S. objections and potentially put U.S. troops in harm's way. Mm -hmm. But we have seen it's already shelled Kobani and Tel Abyad. Mm -hmm. It's threatened to t conduct ground operations in the east. And I think it's very serious about the fact that it views long-term YPG presence on the border of Syria and Turkey to be an existential threat. And so I think Erdogan, especially as elections are coming up in, in <laughs> Turkey, um, is going to be uh, very forceful in his his desire to remove YPG forces, if possible, from the SDF and certainly mm -hmm. physically from the border areas. Mm -hmm. What would you like yeah. to say on that, Jim? Uh, I, I think it, it is possible that uh, Turkey could cross the border with some kind of uh, military movement, particularly if they think that the United States is disengaged or doesn't care, uh, which is why it's very important uh, diplomatically to maintain signaling that the United States is engaged and does care about this issue even if the United States isn't willing to come out for uh, some kind of radical Kurdish autonomy, uh, but at least that the United States would uh, highly discourage Turkey from taking any military action to settle the situation, say that it's an internal issue for Syria to resolve, and that the United States uh, would be in, want to be involved in some kind of negotiated settlement to uh, preserve some kind of Kurdish autonomy. I think that would be a very productive diplomatic signal not just to the Syrians, but also to the Turks. Mm -hmm. What about Idlib? My last question would be Idlib. The equation in Idlib seems to be now shifting because we saw some uh, co collaboration and airstrikes between Turkey and Russia targeting some parts of Idlib together. Um, I mean, what does that singling to us? Are we going to be seeing uh, maybe a major operation between, uh, you know, collaboration between Turkey and Russia to take out Fatah Sham in, in Idlib? It's, 
It's possible, but I, I still think actually Idlib is, is kind of a pickle for everyone in the mm -hmm. sense that this encompasses three million people. It's, it'd be mili just from a military standpoint, a, a difficult and costly operation. Assad has had tremendous difficulty keeping his military fully staffed. Uh, it, it's a question whether even if he wanted to, he could fully invade and hold the territory, especially with that catastrophic losses. It's unclear how much Iran and Russia are willing to expend to, to retake it. Mm -hmm. um, and Turkey obviously has done conducted its operations on and off -ring, but it has uh, not directly conquered the entirety of the country, even though there's observation posts and so forth. And so it, it is a, a very dangerous part of, of Syria. Um, and it, it seems to me that everyone wants someone else to try to deal with the, the, uh, with the difficulty of, of having to actually take it, uh, expend the cost and blood and treasure, and then try to hold it somehow. Um, but at the same time, it's really hard for Assad to claim victory, mm -hmm. um, even in the West, while, mm -hmm. while this uh, is still an outstanding issue. But I don't see the U.S. getting directly in involved in terms of conducting massive amounts of airstrikes mm -hmm. in Libya. It seems to be that Russia and Turkey are going to have to somehow try to take the lead if it's going to be uh, confronted. And where are those three million people are going to go if something like this does happen? Uh, good question, since the uh, sentiments in Europe and in the United States are you know, moving against uh, having more refugees flow there, will they flow into Turkey? Good question. Certainly the Turks don't want to have that happen. Uh, it would be a major crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps the United States would get involved in some kind of uh, mitigation, some kind of humanitarian operation, but I doubt it. Uh, it, would, it would be a, a real tragedy. So on the one hand, people would like to resolve the situation, but that resolution could in fact create a worse crisis mm -hmm. if, if the infrastructure was completely destroyed, if it became uninhabitable, and yes, then people had to have some place to go. Mm -hmm. And if one looks at the tactics that have been used by, for example, the Russian Air Force in Syria, they're much different than what we consider to be humane, humane and, and decent. They don't uh, go to the, the lengths that the Israeli Air Force and the U.S. Air Force does for precision guidance for, uh, to minimize collateral damage. I mean, mm -hmm. in addition to the fact that they you know, carpet bomb certain areas, they in some, have some cases have targeted hospitals because those hospitals help in their view, regenerate fighters. And so mm -hmm. the kind of fighting you would see if Russia were to conduct a massive military operation with Assad and Iran um, would lend itself to tremendous amount of civilian uh, pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's so much more to talk about, but we are out of time. Thank you so much, <laughs> Andrew and Jim, for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. That was it for tonight's episode. Thank you for watching us. Good night.